Hello, and welcome to Full Armor Radio. I'm your host, John Rourke. It's good to be back doing this, and thank you for joining me. Um, this episode, we'll be talking about a little bit about um, apologetics, but particularly um, logical fallacies. Logical fallacies are really, really important to apologetics, or even just um, an argument with anybody about anything. Knowing what logical fallacies are is going to help you, as a Christian, keep the ninth commandment which is you shall not bear false witness um, when engaging in a debate. This is really important because every logical fallacy is a form of breaking the ninth commandment. It's a form of deceit because um, you're not giving an argument that's true. You're giving an argument that's faulty, that's meant to convince somebody without having um, a good reason. So just to be clear, what's a logical fallacy? Well, there, there are multiple types. I'm just going to talk about um, a certain type today. There are, there are formal and informal fallacies. But I wanted to I want to talk about what a fallacy is. Basically, it's just an error in, in your logical reasoning. Um, and the thing about logical fallacies, though, is that people are often convinced by bad arguments. They're often convinced by fallacious arguments because they haven't been trained to see how it's fallacious or see why it's a bad argument. So once you learn these things, um, if you're anything like me, all of, all of a sudden you'll s- start seeing them everywhere. You'll see fallacies going on all the time. And truly, people commit logical fallacies left and right. You'll see it in the newspapers. You'll see it all over the place. It's just sad. And as Christians, we have an obligation um, out of thankfulness to God to honor God. Uh, we want to be truth tellers people who are telling the truth and not liars. And that means that we cannot commit logical fallacies. It's a form of deceit. So um, let's go ahead and get into it. I'm going to be going over some, kind of summarizing or using them as a little outline of Jason Lyle's articles on logical fallacies. Jason Lyle is a wonderful and excellent apologist for the Christian faith. He is a PhD astrophysicist. Um, He does things, um, a lot of things for... um, defense of of the biblical worldview as well as uh, biblical 24-hour six-day creation Um, he's done stuff with answers in genesis and and other christian um, creation groups good groups like that so the these articles are um just kind of on some fallacies he's he's written some books that deal with these things as well Um, he's written the ultimate proof of creation which is a book on presuppositional apologetics very good book i recommend it he wrote a companion book to it, which is just on logical fallacies and dealing with evolutionists' um, logical fallacies uh, called Discerning the Truth, which was a life-changing book for me, honestly. And I believe he's more recently wrote a book, um, like a curriculum book on logic for, for students, I'm pretty sure. I haven't gotten that one yet, but I, I hope to get it at some point. All right, so let's go ahead and pull up these um, these articles from Jason Lyle, and we'll just go through um, go through these fallacies. All right, so here is, uh, let me go back one actually. The article, the article that we're going to start with is the fallacy of reification. Reification, as he defines right here, is attributing a concrete characteristic to something that is abstract. Um, in other words, basically what it ends up looking like is Uh, personifying non-human things. That's a very common way that reification shows itself. For example, if somebody were to say in their argument to you, well, science has proven such and such thing, that's the fallacy of reification on the word science, particularly. Because science is not a person who can prove something and give reasons. Science is, you know, a method. Um, It's something that human beings use. They use a scientific method um, in order to come to conclusions um, about things. Um, So, yeah, stuff. He's talking about fallacies and evolutionist arguments. So he'll say stuff like this. He says, evolutionists may commit this fallacy by saying something like, nature has designed some amazing creatures. Well, this sentence, like as he says, commits the fallacy of reification because nature does not have a mind and cannot literally design anything. Um, by using the fallacy of reification, the evolutionist obscures the fact that evolution, the evolution worldview cannot account for the design of living creatures. Um, so stuff like that, saying that science says, you know, science can't prove something, saying that evidence says or the evidence shows. Well, no, evidence needs to be interpreted um, by people, 
and people are fallacious. People are make errors. So the reason this is a fallacy is that people are artificially bolstering their arguments uh, by saying stuff like, well, science has proven. Well, no, what they're really saying is that some scientists say. Now, some scientists say is much less strong than science has proven because science itself, the thing of science, cannot prove anything. Scientists use science to try to prove things, but scientists, being human, are capable of making errors. So therefore, um, it's easier to argue against scientists than it is against the whole science itself. Um, so they're artificially bolstering their argument. They're making it sound stronger than it really is. I mean, how could you argue against science itself? Well, you know, that's that's why it's 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 a fallacy. But you can easily argue with scientists who, of course, can make errors. So like I said, people will say the evidence speaks for itself. Well, no, evidence does not speak for itself. It has to be interpreted by human beings, and human beings can make errors. Here's a way that, that Christians will often commit this fallacy is by saying something like doctrine divides. Doctrine divides about Bible doctrine. They'll say, well, doctrine divides. Well, no, doctrines don't divide. Uh, people divide over doctrines. People choose which doctrines they want to divide over, for better or for worse. And so doctrine itself does not divide. People divide over doctrine. Um, so there's nothing wrong with doctrine. There's wrong with some people dividing over things they shouldn't divide over. And then, of course, there's a righteous dividing over doctrine where you divide over things that are essential, like the gospel, like justification by faith alone. Paul divided over that in the book of Galatians, for example. So that's reification. Um, we want to avoid that. We don't want to attribute um, kind of <coughs> um, <coughs> concrete characteristics to something that's abstract. Um, in other words, or in the way it really looks, is that really attributing like... Um, but like personifying things that aren't persons, that's the way it most likely will um, show itself. This fallacy saying stuff, like I said, like science says, psychology says, or so on and so forth. All right, let's go to the next one. The fallacy of equivocation. This one's really common. Just like all other fallacies, this fallacy is a form of lying. Um, it is a... It, the equivocation is changing the definition of a term that you're using in your argument mid-argument. Um, so he gives this good example. Jason Lyle, like I said, is a PhD astrophysicist. That makes him a doctor. He's a Dr. Lyle because of his PhD. So he gives this example. Um, he says, doctors know a lot about medicine. Dr. Lyle is a doctor, so he must know a lot about medicine. You see, that example has the equivocation on the word doctor because there are different definitions of doctor. In the first sentence, he's talking about a medical doctor. In the second sentence, he's talking about a PhD. They're not the same thing. So Dr. Lyle is, is not a medical doctor. He's a PhD, so he doesn't actually know a lot about medicine because he's not a medical doctor. But they use the term doctor and form that term, form of reasoning because they change the definition of, of doctor from medical doctor to PhD and then just kind of smash them together. So it's not, it's not good reasoning. Um, this fallacy is also called a bait and switch, just FYI. Um, evolutionists often commit the fallacy of equivocation on the word evolution, for example. They'll say, um, you know, we know that evolution is true, that is, kind of molecules to man evolution, because we see evolution, that is, adaptation, you know, animals um, having different features over time um, happening all the time. They're not, these animals are not changing into different kinds of animals. Um, they just have some different features. So what are called, you know, Darwin's finches from the Galapagos, that's an example of adaptation. You have these these finches going to different parts of the island, and, you know, say over here that these, these finches really need to poke through hard shells of, of you know, creatures to eat. Well, they, the birds over there with the sharpest shells to poke through, they're the ones that are going to survive. So they're the ones that are going to be mating, and having little baby birds that also have sharp beaks. But say over on the other side of the islands, you have um, birds that have bigger, stronger beaks that need to crush. Not poking through things, but they have to crush hard things or something. Well, then those ones are going to survive over here because that's the only food they have. So those ones with the stronger beaks are going to mate, and they're going to have babies with stronger beaks. So you have adaptation um, because of different 
um, areas or different and kind of the survival of the fittest thing, which um, is in and of itself uh, has truth to it. Um, you know, the, the idea of natural selection. Now, ironically, natural selection, that term is actually a, a reification fallacy because nature doesn't select. But the, the concept behind it, which is that, you know, those who are fit, most fit for the environment will survive is just a fact of, of the animal world and of nature. So, but it doesn't mean that we see animals turning into different kinds of animals. It just means that the animals that are most fit to that environment are, are more likely to survive and then reproduce and pass on those genes. And then you'll have that sort of thing going on. So that for, in this example, they're equivocating on the word evolution because they see, well, we see adaptation. So therefore evolution, that is molecules demand evolution is true. Those are totally two different things altogether. So they're equivocating on the term evolution, which is deceitful. Um, so this is very, very common. You'll see it a lot. Um, here's, here's a good example among uh, and, and when, when professing Christians debate. You know, I've talked to, you know, false teachers, people who claim to be Christians but teach a false gospel. And what they do is they'll equivocate on key biblical terms like faith right? They'll say, yeah, we're justified by faith, faith alone, even. They may say, we're justified by faith alone. See, but what I mean by faith is just trust in Jesus, belief in Jesus, trust in Jesus, and not not works, not obedience. Faith is not works. Galatians 3 says the law is not of faith. But then someone else said, yeah, yeah, no, we're justified by faith. And what they mean by faith is their faithfulness, or in other words, their obedience. You see, They've, they're using an entirely different definition of faith in the argument. So they can say, yeah, 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 no, we agree. Justification is by faith. But in their mind, they know, well, by faith, I mean works, right? So we're, there's an equivocation on the word faith. We're not on the same page there. And it's deceitful because it sounds the same, but they mean something else by it. That's a common thing I've seen. All right, let's move on. Fallacy of begging the question. This is extremely common. Um, it's the fallacy of begging the question is committed when a person merely assumes what he is attempting to prove or when the premise of an argument actually depends on its conclusion. So, um, it's, it's basically just assuming the thing you're supposed to be proving. Um, for example, I've heard this one commonly, well, the Bible can't be true because miracles don't happen. But what are they assuming there? They're just assuming that miracles don't happen, or have never happened, I should say, have never happened. They they haven't proven that, though. See, they just assumed, well, miracles aren't true. They never happened, so the Bible can't be true because it claims that there's miracles happened. Well, they've merely assumed that miracles have never happened. They haven't even attempted to prove it. That's a, that's a fallacy of begging the question. Actually, that's the example that he gives. The Bible cannot be true because it contains miracles, and miracles would violate the laws of nature. They're just assuming that miracles can't happen. Um, yeah, here's one on the old earth, young earth creationist debate that he gives. It says, the Bible cannot be true because it teaches that the earth is only thousands of years old, whereas we know the earth is billions of years old. Well, that's begging the question because they haven't given the argument for why they think the earth is billions of years old. Um, they just assumed it. Um, so let's see. Yeah, here's a good one. It makes no sense to deny evolution, like Darwinism. It's a well-established fact of nature. They're just saying, boom, that's my opinion, therefore it's true. So um, that's that's basically what it is. It, it's it's arbitrariness. Giving, telling somebody to believe something without even giving a reason, it's my opinion, so it's true, which of course is a very bad argument. And I would say if, if an atheist or somebody is asking you to accept their arbitrariness, you go back to them and say, would you accept my arbitrariness? Would you accept this argument? Hey, atheist, God exists, because I said. No, it's a bad argument, right? And he would never accept that. So you shouldn't accept um, arbitrariness and begging the question from him. Christians commit this fallacy, and he gives a really good example here. And Christians, please hear this. This is important. Jason Law gives this example. The Bible must be the word of God because it says it is. And what it says must be true, since God cannot lie. So that's actually, in and of itself, that argument alone is begging the question. We should not argue that way. What we need to do is say, um, 
because like, like he says here, but when one of these statements is used to, to, as the sole support for the other, the argument contains the fallacy of begging the question. He says you could use the same line of argumentation to quote unquote prove the Quran, which of course Christians would deny. Because the Quran, people who believe in the Quran, Muslims would say, well, we know that the Quran is the word of God because it says it's the word of God. And God wouldn't lie to us, so it must be the Quran. So it doesn't work that way. The, the problem with this argument and the way you can fix it is by saying the Bible must be the word of God due to the impossibility of it not being the word of God. And here's why. If we reject the Bible as being God's word, then we have no rational basis to account for ethics, um, the fact that nature functions in a law-like fashion, um, which is the foundation for science, and we could not account for logical uh, laws of logic. Um, that's, that's the basis. Those are called the preconditions of intelligibility. Um, I'll go over them briefly real quick. Um, I've talked about them elsewhere, and I talk about them in my videos where I debate atheists uh, on, this, on like the street and stuff. But basically, the reason is, if you can, can an atheist answer the question, why is it wrong to rape? Why is it wrong to murder? Those types of questions. They can't answer that without committing this fallacy of begging the question, with being arbitrary. People will say, well, murder is wrong or rape is wrong because it's hurting somebody. Well, that doesn't answer the question. That's just rephrasing it. Why is it wrong to hurt somebody? Well, because it causes people pain. Why is it wrong to cause somebody pain? Well, because we wouldn't want that. Well, so what? That doesn't answer the question. Why is it wrong, though? From a Christian worldview, the answer is very simple. It's because God has, has said so. Uniformity of nature. Why do you expect, you know, tonight when you brush your teeth, when you squeeze that brand new, freshly opened tube of toothpaste, why do you expect toothpaste to come out? Well, the unbeliever will say, well, because it's always done that in the past. See, that argument itself actually commits the fallacy of begging the question um, because they're assuming that the future will act like the past. And that's just an assumption. Even, even prominent atheists like Bertrand Russell have recognized that you can't argue from the past to the future like that. And I give an example to show the, more easily show the fallacious nature of, of that argument. Um, if, some, if I told you, hey, I'm not going to die in the future, I'm never going to die, and you say, what? Prove it. And I said, well, I've never died in the past. See, it's a bad argument. I'm just assuming that because I haven't died in the past, I'm not going to die in the future. I'm assuming the future is going to be like the past. People do the same thing with laws of nature. And Bertrand Russell, the atheist in the 20th century, admitted this is a problem in his book, Problems in Philosophy. So he was a sharp-minded atheist um, who was able to understand that there's a problem there. So... Um, again, if you reject the Bible, you have no basis for uniformity of nature. You're just assuming it, which is arbitrary and it's begging the question. Um, but from a Christian worldview, I have a basis for not only ethics, but also uniformity of nature. Because again, God said, he said he'll put uniformity of nature, Genesis 8.22, for example. So those are, you know, some examples of how you can prove the Bible is true. Because if you reject the Bible... You cannot make sense of the world. Knowledge isn't possible. You can't make sense of ethics without being arbitrary and therefore, you know, irrational. You can't make sense of science or the fact that nature is uniform. You couldn't do anything without always assuming that nature is uniform. But the atheist has no rational basis to think that the future will resemble the past. Well, the Christian has that basis because God has laid it out in his word. So if you accept the Bible from the get-go, you can account for these things. If you reject it from the get-go, you cannot account and you're reduced to being arbitrary in everything. Therefore, the Bible must be true due to the impossibility of it not being true. Um, so this argument here, this begging the question saying, well, the Bible's true because of 2 Timothy 3.16 where it says all scriptures God breathed, that doesn't prove it um, in and of itself. Um, you have to prove, uh, prove it another way. So... That's begging the question, just assuming the things. Um, like he says here, begging the question is a fallacy because it's arbitrary. Arbitrariness is an intellectual sin. It is just saying something is true just because. And you, nobody should ever accept arbitrariness when it comes to arguments. We have to give a reason for what we believe. And I'm not going to accept what you believe just because you tell me I should. You have to give me a reason. Um Opinions don't matter unless they are backed up with sound reasoning. Um, so, all right, let's do the next one. The fallacy of the question begging epithet. Don't get this confused with begging the question. They're a, a bit different. Um, 
Basically, the question begging epithet, they argue, is using biased and often emotional language to persuade people instead of using logic. Very common, very common on internet forums from everybody. People, you know, like, like name, like, like name calling can be a form of this. Only stupid people would be a Christian. That's not an argument. That's just berating somebody to try to make them shut up and not agree with and, and agree with you. Um, so he gives an example, like if, if a reporter was reporting um, something and they said, here I am, and, and this criminal is charged with violently murdering the innocent victim. Well, there's, it's very emotionally charged, very biased. Well, there's a criminal. That's already assuming that they're guilty. Violently murdering innocent victims. Well, what if that's not the case? What if there was self-defense and it wasn't murder and it wasn't an innocent victim? Um, so they would, they should instead say, so they're not biased. The suspect is charged with killing this other person. See how less biased that is. So biased language is a question begging epithet fallacy, something that, um, people use all the time. Um, it can be, <coughs> um, used in subtle ways like this. Somebody, you know, he's talking about creationists versus evolutionists. And he says stuff like, well, what if somebody in their science department says our, our department is becoming infested with creationists well infested infested gives the the impression of of um you know like cockroaches of vermin um so but it's not actually an argument it just portrays them in a bad light without giving any support to it um so saying hey you know name calling like you're stupid you're an idiot you have um you know everything you believe is so is so stupid what being being a christian is there's no evidence for that is that an argument no see it, people think it sounds like one like you 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 have to ignore all this evidence in order to be a christian well that's not an argument you have to actually provide such as give me some examples of what i'm supposedly ignoring that would you know prove disprove christianity um he gives an example somebody um uh, speaking against the Creation Museum. He says, The Creation Museum isn't about science at all, but it's entirely about a peculiar, quirky, very specific interpretation of the Bible. Is that an argument? <coughs> no. There's no support for that opinion. Um, and I would say this. Opinions, like I said, opinions mean nothing unless they are supported by sound reasoning. And we got to remember that, all of us do, whether we're Christian or not, is that people say, well, that's your opinion. Well, yeah, what well, could be more obvious, but can you refute the opinion with sound reasoning? All right. <laughs> Here's even a good one. If you make an argument and somebody says, well, that's a fallacy. Well, that in and of itself is not an argument. You have, they have to show you which fallacy it is and why your argumentation actually is that fallacy. I've been accused of committing fallacies um, when, in fact, I didn't, and, I, when, and when pressed on it, um, they could not actually give me what fallacy it was or in what way it was fallacious. They were just throwing stuff out there because they didn't like what I had to say. That's actually in the, in the comment section on one of my YouTube videos, a bunch of atheists um, joining, in, joining in on that one and, and claiming I committed fallacies even though they couldn't identify which one it was or in what way it was fallacious. They just said it was, and that doesn't make it true just because you say it. All right, the complex question. This is also called a, lo a loaded question. Basically, it's it's assuming something um, in the question so that the person is trapped either way they answer it. The classic example is, um, hey, hey, Joe, have you stopped beating your wife? Well, if he says yes, well, he's admitting that he used to beat his wife. And if he says no, well, that sounds like he's still beating his wife. There's, there's no way to win. So the way to fix it so we don't ask those loaded questions or complex questions, is to separate it, separate it into two questions. So we should have asked him, did you ever beat your wife? If so, have you stopped doing this now? Because the first question, did you ever beat your wife, he could vindicate himself and say, no. And then there's no need for the second question. But if he says yes, then you say, okay, well, since you, since you did beat your wife at some point, have you stopped doing that now? Um... So here's a good example. Why are creationists against science? So that's assuming something in the question, assuming namely that creationists are against science. Instead, they should, should break that up into two questions. Are creationists against science? If so, why? 
So you can see it, it's basically trying to corner or trap somebody um, by assuming what they believe without actually asking them. Um, so, um, you know, people say, well, why, why are Christians, why do Christians hate people who practice homosexuality? Right? That's a loaded question. That's a loaded question. Why do Christians hate Muslims? That's a loaded question. The question should be, do Christians hate Muslims? If so, why? So you don't want to assume things. You want to, um, you know, ask ask the person what they actually believe or what they actually have done, and then follow up with the second question. Try to try not to mash questions together. That's a that's a a sneaky and deceitful way of of trying to argue by forcing somebody to answer a question where they can't win either way when they answer it. He also makes an important point here. Um, he says what people judge to be a fallacy often depends on their worldview. So the um this this complex question because if i if i were to ask somebody have you repented of your sins yes i'm assuming that they're a sinner the reason that i'm assuming that is because god said so so he says a non-christian may consider this to be a complex question and, and when it divided like this have you ever sinned if so have you repented um from a christian worldview however the question is not complex because we know that all have sinned romans three twenty three. um and it's pretty obvious. And, and there's very few people um, who will say, I've never done anything wrong. Um, so it's something that since we all, well, since generally we, many of us will assume it. Not everybody does, obviously. Some people will deny that they've ever sinned in any way or that there's anything um, known as sin at all. But in general, because if you both assume it, um, and it's a reasonable assumption like that, and based upon the Christian worldview, of course it is, that all people are sinners, then it's not really a complex question. Um, but for things that have not been uh, proven already, you need to ask the, the first question um, without assuming what they believe or what they do, and then ask a follow-up question instead of mashing them together. All right, next one, bifurcation. Bifurcation, also called the false dilemma or the either-or fallacy, is basically saying there are you have two options, and that's it. You pick this one or this one. But in reality, there's a third option, and that's the fallacy, is that you're forcing people to pick from one or the other um, when in reality there's a third, a third option. Um, so, yeah, here's a good one. People will say to Christians, either you have faith or you are rational. So that's a false dilemma. You can have both. That's the third option. Um, Christians can be have faith and be rational. He says, this commits the fallacy of bifurcation since there's a third possibility. We can have faith and be rational. In fact, faith is essential in order to have ratio- rationality, for example, to make sense of laws of logic. That's kind of what I was talking about before with ethics, uniformity of nature, and then laws of logic. Um, so here's another one. Either the universe operates in a law-like fashion or God is constantly performing miracles. Um, this is also fallacious because there's a third possibility. The universe operates in a law-like fashion by and far most of the time, but God occasionally performs a miracle. Um, and as, as, by the way, um, miracles by definition are rare because they tend to violate the laws of nature. Um, so that's kind of what makes it a miracle is that it's contrary to what's normal. Um, all right. So... Um, yeah, you can have debates framed like this, faith versus reason. That's a bifurcation fallacy, a false law fallacy. Science or religion. No, see, there's a third option. You can have both. Um, or the Bible versus science. No, you can have both. You can be a Bible-believing Christian and also do sound science. They're all false dilemmas. Um, none of those are contradictory. There's a third option of having both of them together. Um so he says, science and religion, the Christian religion to be specific, are not mutually exclusive. In fact, it's the Christian system that makes sense of science and the uniformity of nature, as I was briefly talking about before. Likewise, the debate should never be framed as the Bible versus science, since the procedures of science are fully compatible with the Bible. In fact, science is based on the biblical worldview. Science requires predictability in nature, which is only made possible by the fact that God upholds the universe in a consistent way that is congenial to human understanding. Such predictability just wouldn't make sense in a quote-unquote chance universe. Um, so that's that's kind of the false dilemma fallacy, the either-or fallacy, um, claiming that you have to pick one or, one, or, one or the other option, when in reality there's a third option. Um, 
So, <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably sufficient. Let's do ad hominems. There's a couple types of ad hominems. There's ad hominem abusive and ad hominem circumstantial. Ad hominem abusive is just attacking the person who's arguing against you instead of attacking their arguments. So here's some, if, if I was arguing with an atheist and I said, well, you're an atheist, you're just stupid. That would be an ad hominem abusive fallacy. It's not an argument against atheism. It's just attacking the person. Um, so, or in a, a more, a more um, maybe more sophisticated way would be like, I can't believe that, you know, let's just use his example here, that he says you cannot honestly accept John's claims about politics because he, he can't even find a job, right? So that's attacking the person, John, on something totally unrelated. But, well, this guy, he, he can't even get a job. So, I mean, why would you trust him on politics? Well, that's not a good argument. That's attacking the person. John could have really great political claims, really good reasons. Um, but just because he can't find a job doesn't mean that he can't make any sound arguments. Um, so that's like, there's ad hominem abusive, but there's ad hominem circumstantial as well. A very common one would be like, well, you're only a Christian because of the circumstances that you were brought up in. You were brought up in a Christian home. That's the only reason you're a Christian. Well, that's not attacking the claims of Christianity at all. It's just attacking me. Um, my circumstances are irrelevant to whether Christianity is true or not. And that's what we're supposed to be debating. Is Christianity true or is it false? Me growing up in a Christian household has nothing to do with that. Um, it's a distraction. It's attacking my circumstances, attacking me, instead of attacking my position. Um, so that's actually the example that he gives there. Um, here's another one. Creation isn't true. You just believe in creation because you, re you read that stuff on the Answers in Genesis website. Um, <laughs> again, the information on the website may have... Of helped people see the truth of creation and how to argue for it, but the person's argument should be evaluated on its own merit, not on how they arrived at it. So basically, they're saying you think creation is true because you were taught it by people. Well, <laughs> everything we know we've learned somewhere. Um, people have argued against me being reformed in my theology or being Calvinistic. You're only a Calvinist because you, you know you go to a Calvinist church. Well, I learned things from church for sure. That doesn't mean that Calvinism is wrong just because I was taught it. <laughs> I mean, it could be more obvious. Basically, they're saying your church cannot be right no matter what they teach. You know, it's a fallacy um, to say that. It's a, to attack the circumstances in which I learned something doesn't mean that what I believe is false. You have to attack the actual, you know, claims. Next one, a straw man fallacy. Straw man fallacy is when a person misrepresents his opponent's uh, position and then proceeds to refute that misrepresentation rather than what his opponent actually claims. So the image there is that instead of like you're in a boxing match, instead of me fighting the real person, I make a straw man version, which is so easy to knock over or just knock it right over, right? It's not actually him. It's just something I've built that kind of resembles him. So it's misrepresenting your opponent's arguments, so it's easier to, to refute. So common, and Christians, please hear me, this is common on social media so much because you can twist what somebody posted and then respond to it and then keep going forever and say, no, this is, must be what you meant, even if the person says, that's not what I meant. <laughs> um, in person, it's a little easier to shut down straw man fallacies because you can say, well, that's not what I said, and that's certainly not what I believe, and it's much quicker. But on posts, online... I've seen this so many times, and it's a shame, because a straw man fallacy is a lie, and it's a sin, and we cannot do that. That would be wrong. Um, let's see if you give some examples here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, um, you have stuff like, well, if you're, if you're a creationist, you just believe the earth is flat. You just are a science denier. Those are straw men. That's not true. We are not science deniers, and we don't believe the earth is flat. Um, so... <coughs> Yeah, here's a good example. The Bible teaches that the earth has literal pillars and corners and cannot be moved. It's clearly wrong. That's a misrepresentation of Scripture um, because it's clearly speaking in poetic language um, in, that, in that, what they're referring to in the verses they're referring to. Um, <coughs> so basically this happens a lot when you're really ignorant of your opponent's position 
and you start misrepresenting it and responding to that misrepresentation. We can never do that as Christians. Um, atheists will do that um, sometimes about Christianity um, by saying, well, Chris Christians, you know, they'll misrepresent the Bible or misunderstand the Bible. You know, Christians, you know, believe that, you know, it's, it's, it's okay to go and just slaughter everybody in a nation. So that's not true. They're, they're taking things out of context, not understanding God's judgments against nations in the Old Covenant and so on and so forth. Um, you know, whatever they say, if they misrepresent the Bible and say, well, Christians believe that, they're committing this fallacy, the straw man fallacy. All right. Faulty appeal to authority um, is exactly what it sounds like. It's when you appeal to somebody and say, well, that's it's true because they say it's true. So his example is, well, Bill believes in X, therefore X is true. So most common thing, you've heard it many times, um, you know, such and such scientists believe that, so it must be true. Well, okay, but just because somebody who's a scientist made a claim doesn't mean that they are infallible and that their claim is necessarily true. You have to look at that person's arguments and see if they are sound in their reasoning as well. Um, here's an example. Jim has a doctorate in theology. He says it's okay to believe in evolution and the Bible at the same time. Um, who cares that Jim has a doctorate in theology? It doesn't mean that his arguments are good. Um, people say, my pastor said this, so it must be true. No, not necessarily. It, it's only true if he can demonstrate it with sound reasoning from the Bible. Um, so appealing to an expert in an area that's not his area of expertise is certainly a, a common way of doing this. Um, so that's a, a faulty appeal to authority. For example, um, a common one today is appealing to Bill Gates um, on medical advice or on vaccine advice, things like that. Well, Bill Gates is a computer programmer. You know, he's, he's certainly no expert um, on those other things. Um, failure to consider the worldview of the expert and how this might affect his interpretation of the data. So like I said, you know, just because a scientist who maybe is an expert in his field says something doesn't necessarily make it true because his worldview lenses, he may be interpreting something incorrectly. Because I could say, you know, somebody could say, well, this atheist astrophysicist says this. And I could say, well, Jason Lyle, an astrophysicist, says the opposite. Well, it doesn't really matter. The question is, who is the one who has a sound worldview and a sound reasoning on whatever the debate in question is? And then treating a fallible expert as infallible, that's, that's what I was saying before. That's very common. Um, experts can make mistakes. They often do. We all do. Um, nobody should appeal to somebody as infallible, only to God can you appeal to them. You can say, it's not a fallacy to say, well, God has said, therefore it's true, because God is perfect, while man is not. So it's not a faulty appeal to authority when you appeal to God as your authority, because he's a perfect authority. It's a faulty appeal to authority when you appeal to fallible men. Um, yeah, <laughs> so here's, here's some other good examples. Some phrases like, according to mainstream science, or... The scientific consensus is, see, that's just um, a, stat, a faulty appeal to authority or a majority. Well, most scientists believe this. Well, it doesn't mean it's right, you know? Um, you, might doesn't make right. A majority doesn't make, um, you know, make it true. If if the majority of people said, you know, that Hitler's, Hitler was good, it doesn't make it so. Um, so... That's kind of the basis there. So that's that's all the informal fallacy that I just wanted to go over those. Hope that was helpful. I know that's kind of a, a quick run through of them. I would recommend um, reading through the articles yourself. They're on the Answers in Genesis. Just go on, J look up Jason Lyle, Logical Fallacies. It should pop up on Google. But also I'd recommend getting his book, Discerning the Truth. It was really a, a life-changing book for me uh, when it comes to dealing with um, apologetics. Just being able to see, and, and I don't just mean with unbelievers, but also just dealing with debates with other Christians and, and forming theology from the Bible, is that we can, you know, we can see where, where bad arguments are being made. And we don't want to accept bad arguments, because that way you know, we're, we, want, we want to know and believe and say what is true, instead of you know, being taken in by, by faulty argumentation. So, Again, the book's Discerning Truth by Jason Lyle. That's a really good book, or you can just check out you know, that, kind of, that kind of short version there online. Very helpful stuff. Hope this was helpful to you. If you have any questions, um, you can contact me from fullarmorministries.org 
or at cr101radio.com under the Full Armor Ministries podcast page on that website. And there is a contact form at the bottom if you have any questions, comments, or anything like that. So I appreciate you listening. Thanks so much for watching, and God bless you.